Want to tell them who you Hi, are? Hi, everybody. My name's Ronnie Hughes. Um, I'm a glass blower. I'm a flame worker here in North Carolina. Um, I've been doing flame work now for 44 years. Uh, very happy to be a part of the Ridden House Fine Art Fair. Uh, it's a beautiful show. Uh, we're very honored to be a part of it this year, even though it's kind of, kind of a weird year. But what I'm going to be doing here today, I'm um, I'm in the process. Of, I'm going to do the little final assembly on Iris here uh, to give you an idea of, of exactly how my work is done. Um, what I work on primarily are North American wildflowers, and I do orchids uh, from all over the world. Um, I started out doing wildflowers uh, probably 1979. I've uh, I'd been blowing glass at that time for about, I guess, probably about uh, about four or five years. And um, what happened, I got bored one day and went out for a hike, and I found myself in a field of about 200 pink lady slippers, uh, which, as most of you might know, is a very endangered wildflower that is native to North America, especially here on the East Coast. So, they grow a lot. They obviously grow in Pennsylvania and in North Carolina. Um, anyway, I, I discovered all of these lady slippers, and I was so taken by them that I decided that I had to do one. And um, I had so much fun with that creative process that I finally decided to, to do wildflowers for a living. Uh, one of the first wildflowers I ever made after I started with my lady slippers were irises. My mom's favorite flowers were irises, uh, and it's one of my favorite. It's one of the more fun flowers for me to make. What I'm doing here is what we call a petted flower. This is one of my smaller. It's a slightly smaller version of the full size iris that I typically make. Oops which is somewhere in the neighborhood, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of around 30 inch or 25 inches or so. This is going to be a little bit shorter. And what I'm doing right now, I'm attaching green leaves to the stem. And I've got a base, a glass base that is heating up in my kiln right now as we speak. What I'll be doing up here in just a few minutes is bringing it out, and we're going to do the final assembly on this island. What I'm doing right now, I'm just basically trying to hold these, these leaves in place until the glass, when it's molten hot, it obviously is very flexible. But once it cools down, it's up to below a certain point, usually below a thousand degrees. Um, actually, it's um, actually the melting point of the glass is around 1,200 degrees. At that point, that's when the glass first becomes molten. Um, now that I've got part of that out of the way, I can tell you a little bit more about how about how the um, the physical work is done with the torches. Uh, as I said before, what I am is a it's a flame working glass blower. Uh, Flame workers always use torches as opposed to the blast furnaces that most people are familiar with. They're used by the soft glass blowers, the guys that do the big vases and uh, things like that. I think most people are familiar with. Flame working is a little bit more of a delicate process. It usually allows one of the advantages of flame working. It does allow you to pay a little bit more attention to detail. In, uh, when you're constructing a piece. Um, <clears throat> once again, back to the glass. Uh, this flame that you see right here, I use a variety of different torches. Uh, my main torch here, I gonna don't mean to scare anybody, but it, it's a three-stage torch that goes anywhere from a very small flame. That's enough, up, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> huge flame like that. <laughs> My wife is already worried that I'm going to burn the house down. <laughs> the uh, studio down. Even though she's <laughs> familiar with this story. Anyway, I, th this flame is about, is about 3,500 3, degrees. Um, well, just for sake of commenting, it does look in this video like your flame is hitting your ceiling. That's why I said that was well, enough. Okay. It's very, you know, it was intense. 
it's a, this this particular flame here is about 3,500 degrees. Uh, the torch is run with propane and oxygen. Um, I use um, a liquid tank of oxygen. Um, Bear with me here. I had something to disconnect. Let me get this back. These little clear glass screws that you see, they're basically here to hold all of these pieces in place while I'm fusing them in and making sure that they're stable from a structural standpoint. And that's also what um, the reason I'm using this small torch is to make sure that these leaves are fused in properly. That makes for a stronger piece of glass. The glass I use, by the way, is more silicate glass, uh, chemistry glass, basically. I'm sure most people are familiar with Pyrex glassware. Um, it's basically the same type of glass uh, that I'm using. I just obviously do something a little bit different. Okay, now that those leaves are fused in here, let me get this torch off. In case you all can see, these little clear screws right here, they're holding those leaves into place so that when I've set this into a glass base, they're not going to start flopping around and, and hard to manage. I have a I have a base that is cooling off in my count. These are my Oops. annealing ovens. These annealing ovens are used to, to take stress out of glass. They're also good for preheating things. This is a base I've made just previous to the demonstration. I'm doing this a little bit out of, um, I need to warn you all, I'm doing this a little bit out of sequence and so now I when I might lose this base. Uh, now, what do you have to heat that t base up to? All I'm trying to do right now is just keep the base hot. I don't want it to crack. It's right around 1,000 degrees. And um, once it gets up to around 1,200 degrees, it can start deforming. But I want to make sure and keep it nice and hot. Because typically, I don't do this in this sequence. I wanted to do this in a way that would make it a little bit more interesting for you folks out there and also not take forever. Um, a lot of times when I'm doing the work on my wildflowers, it's a little bit like watching paint dry. Um, so sometimes it gets a little bit tedious. I wanted to do something that was a little bit faster. Ronnie, we have a question. Uh -huh. Do you want to take it? Sure. Is it a propane torch? It's a propane and oxygen torch. It uh, has propane, uh, it's, a, it's what's called a surface torch. The gases are mixed on the outside of the torch, uh, so it's a combination of oxygen and propane that's creating the fire. Okay, now, as you can probably see it, this, where I have attached this piece to its base, it's still a little bit red, that means that it still moves. I kind of have to hold it until it's ready. Now the handle that I had that I was holding on to the base with, it's a temporary handle. It's um, basically a punchy. And what I'm going to do right now is break this, knock it off. Hopefully I'm going to knock it off. And it's wanting to be stubborn. Oh, I'm supposed to do this this way. What am I oh, doing? Yeah. <laughs> And of course, my base is not wanting to come off. Oh, I wrote it, there rotate it. It said I can rotate you guys. I'm sorry. I'm not sure. Oh, I can't turn it while live. I'm sorry. Sorry, I was trying to turn my. I had to turn it before that we went live. Apologies to you, folks. Thank you. <laughs> You're securing it now with, uh, it's not a jeweler's torch. 
But how hot does that torch get? How hot? Uh huh. Four thousand degrees. Right now it's four thousand right degrees. About four thousand degrees. Yeah, but when, when you see the glass and the glass is red hot, usually it's in the neighborhood of around uh, anywhere from eighteen hundred up upwards to around twenty five hundred degrees. Um, yeah, the longer you heat the glass, it, it, it literally is a liquid when it's being heated, and you can heat it to the point where, uh, to where it literally, literally drips like water if you get it hot enough. This is one of my primary tools, which is, uh, this is my graphite base that I use to flatten pieces off, flatten pieces out with. And also to make sure that a piece is stable and well balanced. Um, obviously, you don't want a sculpture that is going to be tipped over easily. Okay, basically, I've, I've got the piece set the way that I want it. Now I've got to take those screws off. Do that carefully. The trick of this is try not to hit what you've already done. In some of your larger pieces, how many screws do you have to have at a time sometimes? Oh, sometimes um, I do a, I make a, a sunflower which has in the neighborhood of about 26, 25 leaves growing up um, on the stem, and each one of those leaves has to be braced when I'm fusing them together. Uh-huh. So that piece looks like a mess before I'm done with it. So a little bit more. We have a question, Ronnie. Okay. Do you start every piece with those glass rods that they're seeing on the table here? Yes, on the I bench? do. Yes, I do. Um, the, the colors, all the colored glass is, is behind um, us in those boxes? Yes, those, uh, yeah, some of it. Hand up back there, that'll show the, the different, different colors I use. And you used to uh, create your own colors early on, but stop I do, that. Um, I do some of my own colorations, but I, I buy most of them all. And the, the main reason is that, uh, you know, the colors, it's heavy metals. They're really toxic. Um, and I just feel like it's a little bit, at my age, at my advancing age, I'm just trying not to take as many risks as I used to. That gets a little bit tricky because your life, it, it's real easy to put that iris in my lap. That's not fun. Okay, that's basically it, guys. Uh, Alright, let me give it closer. Nice. Um, the yellow in it is sort of an interpretation of a, of a, a bearded iris. Um, I do a much larger version of this iris that's a little bit more detailed. And there's a, another little
I want Let me see what time it is. What time it is? Ronnie, look at this lily. Talk to them about this lily right here. Okay, say, yeah, this piece is a, a little day lily. Or I'm sorry, not day lily. A lily in the valley. Um, it was actually one of the first wildflowers I, that I made. Um, uh, I, um, we finally started growing lily of the valley here in North Carolina a little while back. They don't, they tend to grow a lot better up north, but it's one of the it's one of the most delicate flowers that I make. It's also one of the most has one of the most beautiful fragrances I'm, that I've ever smelled. Uh, it's always a treat in the spring when these grow when these pop up. But this is more, one of my more medium pieces. Uh, you this, blow each one of those. Yeah, each blossoms. one of these little bells are each hand blown uh, as you can tell by uh, as probably most of you could tell by what I was demonstrating earlier a lot of my a lot of my work is actually more sculptural in mad in, in in nature um, I do a lot of blowing also but since I'm working with wildflowers I don't have to blow as as much as I probably did when I first started blowing glass Around Christmas time, I blow Christmas ornaments and things like that. But when it comes to when I decide to specialize in flowers, that kind of that kind of shifted my work away from more blowing, more over into the sculpture uh, realm. But the only time that you actually blow into a piece of glass is when you're trying to make it hollow, either making it hollow or you're adjusting an already hollow uh, 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 structure. And Ronnie, were you going to show them how you can determine when the stress is? Oh yeah, uh, yeah. One of the mo as, as most of you saw, I put uh, as I put that piece in the kiln. Uh, while I was working on that piece of glass, stresses were building up inside the glass that you have to take care of that stress. If you don't, if if you don't, it's an it's an accident waiting to happen. Um, what I was going to show you too is that uh, I have a, a a device over here called a polariscope. And it's one of the most most valuable tools I have because I, since I'm working with a delicate medium, being wildflowers, I have to make them as strong as I can. Otherwise, I'm asking for to do a lot of repair work. My work is repairable, also, by the way, uh, and I also do that. This uh, this little contraption here is called a polariscope, and it's it's basically just a polarized lens. Uh, as you can see, it's got I can't some cracks. see. I can't see. You got to put it in front it's of the light. It's got some cracks. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's been cracked a few times but after I'm done with a piece what I do is I, I examine all my pieces on this device and a cool thing happens if you've got a stressed piece of glass you'll see this glass rod it, it looks pretty normal and then when you get to a spot like right there or then right there I, I think most of you can probably see that yeah. that coloration in the glass that indicates a stress line in the glass now I don't know if you can see my my uh, index finger here but right there is where there's a lot of stress and right there and in all likelihood if I don't do if I don't fire this piece of glass and get the stress taken care of it's going to crack right there it'll probably crack right there and it'll probably crack right there uh, but that just gives you a little bit of an indication of once I've completed a piece of glass go it basically means that it's going to eventually get broken so uh, so I want to make sure that's as strong as possible once again I'm working with a medium wait problem. wait we have a question oh okay um, is the stress air in the piece no it's not air it's just literally where the molecules of the glass um, are kind of pulling against each other as, um, as the glass cools down as the glass cools down, everything contracts as it as it heats up. It expands when it cools. It contracts, and when you've got disproportionate cooling, which whenever I'm hitting one part of a glass piece of glass, another part is cooling down. You've got this disproportionate cooling, expansion, and contraction, and that's where the stress comes from. It's not actually air that's in the actually air can create stress inside a piece of glass, but there there shouldn't be any air uh, in any of my pieces. Uh, that was a good question. Yeah, it looked like it. air when I looked at yeah, it. Yeah, a lot of times it does look like air. And you know, in glass, you know, because you're seeing not only the front of a piece of glass, you're also seeing the back of it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk, it, a lot of times it creates some distortions uh, visually. A lot of 
lot of times, sometimes you can, I can look at a piece of glass, and sometimes I'll see, well, I think it's a crack, and then you look closely at it, and instead of being a crack, it's just where another piece of glass is happening. And sometimes it's a little bit misleading. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is show them the yard a little bit. Get you out here. I don't know if you, any of you saw, but this kind of helps keep him in a good creative mood. And now we're going to go in. Um, I... Oh, here we are. We're back. We're back. We're back. I'm sorry. Sorry about that, folks. Our uh, router just gave us a hard <laughs> time, so let's start right here, Ronnie. <laughs> okay. Um, this is one, um, of course, this is an American wildflower. This is a Turk's cap lily. Um, one, one of the things I wanted to talk about, uh, one of the things that has always fascinated me about uh, about uh, flowers in general is how they reproduce themselves and how they pollinate. We got a whole bit spiders trying to build a web up here uh, but this is one of the, this is one of the most fun pieces of glass I make there's uh, I get to play oh, with so many out. different I get to play with so many different uh, different streaks and colors of orange and yellow and red it's a lot of fun oh yeah I really do love this piece uh, oh yeah, one of the things I was going to tell that we were going to talk about, you know, this is a pretty much a standard, you know, uh, this is, when people think about pollination and reproduction, this is this is one of the typical flowers that people think of that you can relate to with the stamens and the pistils, um, the ovary for the flower, the ovary for the seed is in the in, is here and the stamens of course are the male component of Hold the flower. Hold it still a minute. For uh but these are kind of easy, but when I started working with orchids, I was, I just really got fascinated by the, by the differences in the way that they all, uh, that they are pollinated and the way that they reproduce. Uh, one of my favorite flowers uh, since I've been in my career has been the, 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 uh, the Phragmopedium caudatum. Uh, it's also called, it's also called a Phragmopedium grande. Uh, it's now extinct in the wild. This is this is one of the uh, one of the Amazon forest right. flowers that basically they've burned the habitat for it. Uh, but this one of the reasons why this flower fascinated me were, were the long were the really long sepals. That, um, a lot of the orchid growers call these whiskers, and they can get really incredibly long. This particular flower it grows from uh, the 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 box. This is basically a, a shadow box that we've got this piece in. But if you can imagine this piece growing from the ground up, it's a terrestrial orchid. And what happens? One of the reason one of the reasons I was so fascinated with this orchid is because what happens? It can actually grow to be approximately. Now I'm not that down tall, there. <laughs> about about that tall from the ground. It grows from the ground up. And these whiskers, what happens when the flower blooms, and it blooms for about a solid month, this whisker is only about three inches long in, in the beginning, but it grows at a rate of about an inch and a half to two inches every day. It just continues to grow until eventually it touches the ground. Uh, once the once the whip, the sepals stop, once they touch the ground, they stop growing at that point. But here's what what happens next is is so cool. What happens is that ants wind up crawling up that sepal, and what they do, they go by this part of the flower right here that's called the column of the flower, and that's where the, this is where pollination takes place in this particular orchid. So the ant goes up here and he roots around and then he comes back down and he may go up to another plant and pollinate it. Uh, so, so now this was all just a theory on this particular plant and like I said, you know, it's, it no longer exists in the wild. You, uh, you can see them in botanical gardens here in the States, like down in Florida, you can, you can find them. About any good botanical garden that has a good orchid garden will usually have an example of one of these. 
But uh, but anyway, that's just literally the theory. They they don't know it for a fact, but they but they think that they theorize that that's how that particular orchid was pollinated. And then you go from something like that, and then you come all the way over here to uh, this is uh, this um, way too hot. Push it back. Oh, is it too 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 way bright? too hot? Okay. I'd take it right out. Okay. This is called the Star of Bethlehem. It's an Angracum orchid, and uh, Charles Darwin dis Charles Darwin discovered this orchid on the island of Madagascar uh, um, back in uh, well. <laughs> forgotten when Darwin lived, but during his travels, he discovered this orchid, and he made a prediction about it. He said that somewhere on this island you're going to find, you will find a moth that has a proboscis, or its nose would be, uh, would be uh, approximately 11 to 15 inches long. And what, sure enough, uh, 50 years after Darwin died, they discovered the great hawk moth. And the great hawk moth, what it, it's, it's, a, it's a very large moth. It has a wingspan probably about that big. But it has, uh, it's, it has a, a, its nose is, is wound up like a fire hose, basically. And when it comes to a flower like this, I can't, I can't see with your arm in the way. Oh, sorry. When, when it comes to the flower, what it does, it unfurls that, that proboscis, and it's about this long. And what it does, it goes in through the column. Once again, this is where pollination takes place on the flower. The, the tongue goes in and all the way down through here. What happens on this particular orchid, po uh, 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 nectar will wind up collecting and it will come down this hollow tube and it might fill up to maybe about an inch and a half to two inches. So if he's going to feed, he has to get his tongue all the way down to there. Uh, and sure enough, it's 50 years. Darwin had been dead 50 years before they discovered the great hawk moth and sure enough, it was uh, it was the way that that particular one was pollinated. Also, the ghost orchid, which is very, which of course is very uh, famous down in Florida. This is uh, this is this is the most rare North American orchid. Uh, it only grows in the Everglades, but it's also pollinated in the same way. It has the same spur that comes down through here, and the hawk moth also pollinates that particular flower. And we got some other. Uh, other American wildflowers, of course, black-eyed Susans. Oh, that's kind of, yeah, that looks nice. That's one of Chris's favorite flowers. She's, uh, Chris, my wife taught me a lot about how to do black-eyed Susans. My mom used to grow more of a domesticated black-eyed Susan that was huge. Oops. Uh, and when Chris saw my black-eyed Susan, you got to make them smaller than that. So she taught me a lot about them. This is a bee bomb, uh, which is in the mint family. Bee bombs are really, I've always been fascinated by bee bombs because they have a square stem. Take it right out. Honey. Take it out. Yes. Okay. Take it out. This particular piece, uh, I don't know why bee bombs have a square stem. I don't know why a square stem is considered to be more evolutionary evolutionarily stable than a cylinder but uh, but I would I made my first my, I made my first bee bomb and brought it to one of my collectors in blowing rock and he said Ronnie you, you, did, you didn't know that you weren't making your stems right did you and I said well I didn't know that I Oops. wasn't and he brought he was growing them at the time and he brought me one and, and he showed me it's got a square stem so he taught me a lot about how to do bee bombs. These are the, the style bases that he developed. They're very organic looking. I wonder if you could catch a signature. Uh, the, yeah, there's a signature right there. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now we're going to go over here.
You're going to talk about this orchid? Okay, or? this, is, uh, this is an Australian orchid. Um, it's called a spotted sun orchid. Uh, I've never actually seen one of these. It's uh, I, the, All the botanical gardens I've been in, they didn't have it. But I loved it because of its, I, I love the, the subtlety of the lavender. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at mushrooms. I'm not sure oh, what's okay. happening. <laughs> all right, just a minute. You put it, you, you changed the lighting. You cannot see it. Yes, yes, yes. I like the fan, I like the, the leaf work in this piece too. Now let me get closer to see the, the actual blossom. And you said this is in where, Australia? Yeah, Australia and uh, Taiwan also is where it's native. Probably hot, I would imagine, very hot environment. Yeah. Looks like we're doing better outside of the display. This yes. is just a standard little daffodil with a hummingbird feeding. This whole is you know, a little bit more. Uh, I, I really like, I love hummingbirds. I'm a big hummingbird fan. I'm a bird watcher and, and actually we we live in a very rural area. We uh, This year we were feeding, I estimated somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 hummingbirds this year. So it was, um, they, they were, we really got mobbed by them this year. Uh, hey, did you show the gate wax? Mm -mm. No. This is uh, this one also might be interesting to, if you can get a close up. Of it. Oops, I don't know if you can get, if you can catch the bells, the individual bells on these or not. This is a mountain wildflower that grows uh, up here on the parkway. Uh, about any uh, those are all hand done. In, any overlook that you see on the Blue Ridge Parkway. How many would you say are on that? Uh, this one here, I usually do this as a double. There's usually two stems of these. There, there's probably in the neighborhood of around 150, uh, 100, 125, 130 uh, flowers. And uh, when the leaves what are they there. do that this particular flower um this particular flower it's it's interesting because you hardly ever catch it when it's actually in bloom it 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 blooms and falls off all within about a week uh, so usually if you don't catch it at the right time typically you'll see just the stem with no flowers on it uh, and that's another reason why I like to do this flower because you really yeah it's a stroke of luck if you actually ever see one of them in bloom and that really has a, a, a very translucent quality to it Okay, and I'm just going to show you these little guys. These are petty fluids with a cobweb. <laughs> what? <laughs> cobweb? Ronnie. I'm going to go on back in. No, we haven't done this one. We that's, yeah. This is another version of the Fragmentadium Cognato. I think that's okay right there. Yeah, that looks nice. Yeah. And that's on a base. This is on a base with almost six leaves. Okay. So, okay. I'm just okay I'll just take you slowly out of here this was a double trout I don't think he he talked about this one and it's called a double trout because the leaves have the modeling like a trout would
going back in the studio and you said you might take a few minutes to yeah. <clears throat> Hold on a second. I'll be right back. Okay. These are artists behind us, um, Tony and uh, Robin and Daniel. 